All right. Hear me? No? Yes. Ah, now it's coming. Take a little time here, I guess. Um, I want to talk about uh, something here that, uh, about two things, about a vapor and about heaven. And uh, you may not realize what's going up behind me, but that's actually eternity he's putting up. He's got a long ways to go, I'll tell you. Because once he gets to this San Diego, about several times around the universe, and it's still not even going to be close. But he's going to bring it over to about here. And uh, uh, I want to I read some verses, and I'll, I'll start, because there's some important things here. that area where We are close to the end of time, in the sense that, you know, the end times, the reason, end of time. Because once we enter into eternity, there won't be any need for time because there'll be no measurement of time. It's an unusual thing for us. We don't quite, it's hard to understand that everything is, everything is before us. But we're going to talk a little about this. I'm going to go into Revelation, uh, and I'm going to, uh, uh, I want to go over some things, and I want to, and this is kind of an illustration. I hope you'll understand what, I, what I'm trying to get through what I'm trying to make you understand about this present life. But right now, let's pray. Dear Lord, oh Lord, we love you so much, and you're such a good God. You do so many good things for us. We, we want to understand more about you. And Lord, as, we, uh, as I speak tonight, I pray, Lord, that you would speak through me. You would give me the words you want me to say to, who, to those people in this audience who need something from you. And I pray, Lord, you would give it to them. Lord, thank you for your goodness, your mercy in this beautiful day, this place, these dear people. And God, I pray you would bless it in a mighty way. Lord, we pray and thank you and look forward to what you are going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, in, um, as you can see, there's uh, eternity. It's, uh, it'll look better in a little while. You just give, give me a few minutes here. Okay, let's turn to Revelation. I want to read a couple of verses in Revelation um, Revelation 19, and I'm just going to read the, the verses, and you'll understand here as I'm going along. Revelation 19, uh, verse, verse 20 says, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. I'm going to go to uh, chapter 20, verse 10. And the devil that deceived, that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And down the verse uh, 14 and 15. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. At this point, this is the end of evil. There won't be any more evil at this point. It will be clear there's going to be nothing. There's nothing that, could, that will hurt, cause hurt, pain, anger, Nothing. At this point, this is the end of evil. They're cast into the lake of fire. Everybody's in there, and that's forever and ever and ever. And now, I want to read here, starting in uh, chapter 21, what John read, what John uh, saw in his vision. It says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more seas, there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death 
neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal and had a great wall and high, and had twelve gates, and as at the gates twelve angels and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. And on the east three gates, and on the north three gates, and on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with a reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. By the way, that's about uh, 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles tall. 1,500 miles cube. It's coming out of heaven. If that's set on the earth, it would cover half of the United States. That's the New Jerusalem. And he measured the wall thereof in 140 and four cubits according to the measure of man, that is, of the angel. And the building of the wall of it was jasper, and the city was pure gold like unto clear glass. The fount and the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophus, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth an amorist. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein, and the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. <clears throat> and the city had no need of sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb of the light, the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth shall do, sh do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall be no wise, there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And he showed me a pure river of water of life clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river there was the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the, na healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servant shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and no need of candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Um, this is coming. God was very careful about that, and, and he said, here, these words, they're true, they're faithful. This is what's going to happen. 
Now, I'm going to do one more thing here. Let's see, put all this nice eternity up behind me. You know what that is? That's now. That's our life. That's us right now. That little thing right there. Now, I want to tell you something. When you get just start into this, you start in this eternity. You, now listen to this. You're going to wish you never complained about one thing for what God gave you. The earth in, in this time over here, this isn't, you know, you're not going to have a chance to tell God uh, all these, you know, do things for the Lord or people because everything's going to be done. Everything's going to be perfect. There's not going to be any problems, nothing. This is going to be wonderful. The only, this little time over here is the time when God has allowed man to run things. And, and we haven't done a very good job. And he's showing us we can't. We need him. But, and it's not perfect, and it's not, it's not fair. There's, there's difference in the people, and you look around, and you say, well, I don't understand this, and I don't understand why, you know, I'm, I'm having a hard time now, and why God says, I gave you life, and I've offered you all this, and I'm going to give it to you. Now, that little time back there, that little time, that'll be your story for eternity. Eternity. And God's going to lift up things like uh, a man who controls his own spirit is better than a general that could take a city. He's going he's to reward people who, were, who honored him. There's going to be people he's going to lift up and give honors to that you never heard of. Because those people simply obeyed God with, what, with the fruits of the spirit they had and did the best they could. And God looked at that and was pleased with that. And he's going to lift these people up. This is the time now. We, we're thinking, oh, man, this is, this is hard. This is tough. And you think, well, you know, it's not easy. Uh, people, people give me a bad time for being a Christian. Do you know how much God loved you? Do you know how much he loved you? How much you personally were worth to him? His God's life. He gave his life. Do you possibly imagine he doesn't love you? Of course he does. We go through struggles and we go through pro problems in our, in, in our life. I mean, it's hard for us to, to, to understand some of these things, but we have a God who loves us. We all have different things. And you know, I've heard uh, people say that uh, people who go through the, the worst, the hardest trials in life can be the greatest witnesses for God. Because you go through a hard life, when you start talking about love, people, they, people understand that. They, they listen. And God, you know, God takes that in consideration, too. You, you have a hard life, but you overcame, you tried, you, you made the effort that he knew, he knows all the things that are against you. He knows that. He knows our limitations. And when we, we, get, when we go into heaven, it's not going to be, okay, me and my wife, we're going to heaven together. Or me and my family, we're all good, we're going to heaven. Or me and my great church, we're all going to heaven together. No, it's not going to be like that. It's you. They're going to sit there before the Lord. You. It's not going to be all what you had did. And he doesn't care about, the world cares about things like if you got a lot of money, uh, if you got um, what they consider good looks, uh, if you have um, some great talent, you know, or if you, you can run the 100-yard dash and, or 100 meters or whatever. I mean, they, they lift people up like that. That is how God looks at it. He doesn't look at the outside at all. He looks at the heart, and that's what he's going to look at. And I told you a story about this guy who climbed Mount Everest. God is not going to say, hey, boy, that was really a great job you did. Come on. Well, it's really great, you know. He's going to say, what would you do for me? Okay, you did that for you, and you lift yourself up, and you got a plaque on the wall. Tell everybody about it. What'd you do for me? Um, I was uh, in the news, you know. Uh, of course, there's a whole lot of good things in the news. I remember there's a particular woman. 
Um, I won't go into that, but she's a comedian, and, and uh, her career is going down the tubes because she, she did this terrible thing with uh, the president's head. She had some kind of a picture there. And she's, uh, she says, he, the president, has destroyed my career. He's done it. He's an author, of course. Well, they said that he also, you know, sent the, he's, he was the reason we had hurricanes, but they say a lot of things about him. But anyway, uh, I, I read something in that paper about her. What she had done at one of the award ceremonies, she won this award. And um, she came up to the podium and she said, you know, I heard a lot of you people come up here and say, you thank the Lord Jesus Christ. She said, well, I don't thank the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't do anything for me. He said, I did it all myself. And she held that, held that award up. She says, this is my God. Now, the Bible says God is not mocked. That, that woman, from that point on, her career just went kaboom. And, and she's strong. She can't believe your friends that she, you know, liberals even turn against each other. Or they did anyway. And uh, so she's trying to blame somebody for that, but God is the one. You can't, you can't mock God. This life, this time that we have, there's nothing that can happen in this life that's going to compare to what God's given you. And there's nothing you have gone through to compare of what God went through for you, what Christ went through for you. Now, if you, if you can think for a minute how bad, how a perfect, holy God could take on every single sin of the world. And then God the Father had to pour his wrath because he's, Christ was protecting us. And he poured all that wrath on him. It, what, a, what a terrible thing that, that, that was for him, a hard thing to go through. It was nothing like Nothing like anything we, we say is bad or hard. And, and Jesus says, yeah, you, you've, you've gone through a hard thing, but look, look, what I'm, I'm, I'm giving you everything. I'm, I want you to go through. I want you to stand strong. I want you to learn to love. I want you to learn to forgive. Those are good things. I want you to not be hate. I don't want you to hate other people. I don't want you to do those things. You know, uh, God, no matter how bad, no matter how bad things might look, God has given you something that many in this world can't reach. He's given you the joy of heaven. And that's going to be for, you can't count the years, the joy, the peace. And it's going to be, every person there is going to be like the best friends and the angels are going to be. You know, I was trying to imagine, you, know, you think sometimes about how this situation could be. But I remember reading about uh, the Queen of Sheba when she went to visit Solomon, King Solomon, to prove him, because she heard all this about him. And, um, and when she got there, she says she started looking around, and one of the things she saw which just amazed her was the, was the happy faces of his servants. And she was just overwhelmed. And they were, it was all at a joy just to be there. I think we get glory. It's, it's, there isn't going to be, there's nothing to be jealous about in heaven. Everybody, everybody is perfect. Everybody is your friend. Everybody is someone you love. And Christ, good night, he's going to be there and walk among us. And what does he ask us to do? Go through this life and not complain. To be content, not covet. He knew what the temptations were, were going to be. He knew that. He didn't want us to do that. He didn't want us to. Um, I remember feeling, I remember reading about a man, and uh, you probably have heard about this guy. He, uh, he was a man and his wife, and they had a family. I think there were seven children driving through Texas. And there was this piece of metal on the road, and it was kind of a, you know, and they, they ran over it, and it bounced up and, and went right up straight through the gas tank and crashed right through the bottom of the car and basically exploded the gasoline inside the car almost instantaneously became a ball of fire inside the van and the man could barely barely got the thing to the side of the road and he was burned badly he couldn't he couldn't reach any one of his children which was ages i think 14 down to a, a child in a car seat and none of them made a sound 
and, and all of his children died. The oldest one lived for a little while, but then he ended up dying. And, and all seven died in that, that crash. And his wife had, and him were just burned. And they're standing outside after the crash. And of course, all the, all the journalists come and he shoved that mic in front of his face. How do you feel? Oh, you want to you wanna punch these guys? How do you feel? They expected him to weep and to, but he said, God has prepared us for this. And they were shocked. They couldn't believe this guy said this. How, how can you say, how can you do that? How can, he knew about this. He thought about this. This life isn't for us to try to, how much can we get? How much, how much? How much, can we, how much stuff can we get? How much relaxation? How much fun can we have? Let's, let's just do whatever we can. Climb the mountains, you know, go there, go here. It's, no, it's to serve God, to honor God. That's because what's going to happen after this is nothing compared to what's coming. And this guy understood that, and these people couldn't. And you know what happened? He became this witness. And, and my understanding about this is he, uh, he, had a, he had a track he put out about that, and many people came to the Lord with that, and he ended up going to, uh, he was in Russia. He went and had a, um, and the people, of course, heard about him. Everybody understands tragedy. And he had, I don't know how many thousands of people came in the stadium to listen to him, and many thousands of them came to Christ listening to his testimony. So you think, why did God do that? God has purposes for everything, and I can tell you right now, if you're angry with God about something in your life, and I I'm not saying I can answer questions, but I know this. I know God's a good God who does things, and I know he, that he has plans that are outside of our realm of comfort. He has bigger things going on with us, and we want to serve him. He uses us sometimes. And when we get to heaven, we, when he gives us knowledge of all things, you will say God is a good God. He did good things. I just didn't know all these other things that happened. There could be people in heaven that, that could only be reached through your struggle that you don't even know about. You just, you don't see that. And there's people, you know, I remember there's a young girl that uh, came on one of the mission trips and she had just a terrible things happened in her life. And, and she said, I don't know why God put me through all this. And I said, well, to tell you this, you're 17. I said, there's a lot of young people who are going through just what you're going through. And they would listen to you, but they would never listen to me. They'd say, ah, you don't know what I'm going through because I hadn't gone through that. But you have. You go through something terrible and somebody else does, you can talk to them. They'll let you talk to them because you've been through it too. So you just don't know what God, if you, if you look for what God could possibly have had, a, just try to follow him. Don't get angry with him. He's the best friend that you've got. I, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just read through some verses here. And, uh, and I remember, you know, now when you look at this, you look at this and you think about this for a minute. The statement, remember Lot's wife. She, was, she wanted to look back at the world. She didn't want to follow. She wanted to look back. Hey, I don't want to leave that stuff. That stuff. Man, if there's one thing this country's got is stuff. I'm telling you. Stuff all over the place. And, I, and I'm, not trying to say, I'm not trying to say it's bad. I'm saying it's, but it's, you get caught up in that, and you miss what's important. You have to be careful. The stuff is a blessing from God. I give that glory to him. Okay. Habakkuk 3, uh, find Habakkuk here, and um, I'm, I'm just going to go through some, some verses here because uh, okay, Habakkuk 3, uh, verse 19. Uh, well, let me start at 17. I'll go 17 and 19. It says, Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall the fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. And he will make my feet like hinds feet, and he will make me to walk upon mine high places. God wants you to trust him even when things look so bleak. And I'm telling you, Satan knows how to make them bleak, man. He's the master of that. It will, it will be worth it all. 
more than you can. We can't even describe this. The Bible says you couldn't even imagine. I mean, they try to give you a few things, and you think, well, man, gold is pure glass, you know, I mean, stuff like that. That we kind of recognize. But what God's done, we, we don't. Okay, look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians four. Second Corinthians four, chapters eight to ten it says, "We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body of the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body." God stays with us through this time. He knows this is not an easy time for us. He knows that. He's been through it. He knows the, the, the plight of the human body. He was, that's why he came as a human. And he went through the things he went through so that he could understand you and, and he loves you. And, you know, we, I, I um, look at, um, let's see if I can remember this first. Um, now I'm thinking out in the wild. Anyway, the verse, uh, it's a wonderful verse. Uh, I'll, I'll just tell you that, that when you call upon God, there's something he always does. It's two things. This verse talks about that. Number one, he draws near when you call upon him. And when you call upon God, there's usually some problem, some issue, some fear that you have, that you're turning to God and asking him. So this verse says, when I call upon you, you draw near unto me and you say, fear not. God wants us to understand he's there and he loves us. And he will take care of us. Just don't be afraid. That, that is such a, I love that verse. Anyway, um, look at uh, Isaiah 43. And Isaiah, oh man, there's a whole Isaiah is just full of stuff that's just the, some, of the, some of the things that God, if, you, if you're searching, as I was talking about this morning, you look through, you find these things. It's just, it's just wonderful. When you read. 43, uh, verse 2. And God says, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. It's the power of God's protection. God is a protecting God. Now, a lot of this stuff I take out of the Old Testament. And I take it out of the Old Testament because we aren't Israel, but Israel was God's family, and now we were adopted into that family. We are in the royal family of God. So these words, God wouldn't change he still applies him to us. He loves us. Okay. Um, look at Luke chapter 11. And uh, see, I'll bounce around here a little bit, but sometimes you. Uh, Luke. Luke 11. Um, 11, 11. 11, 11 through uh, 13. And this is, God's just making it clear, just, you know, you, when you think badly about God. He says, if a son ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he, give the, will he give for a fish, give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to do give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them who ask him? Wow, I'm telling you, the Lord is, is, so, is, is so good and so misunderstood because we, we listen to people who, who are angry with God and they try to convince us that God isn't worth trusting. Psalm 81. Uh, 
Psalm 81, verse 13 and 14. God says, Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me, and Israel had walked in my ways. I should, have soon, I should soon have subdued their enemies and turned my hand against their adversaries. God was doing this for Israel. He'll do that for us, for the problems that we have. He'll take care of us. He, he wants us to turn to him, to trust him completely, be willing that no matter what, man, you put your life on the line for God and, and do that step out in faith, be willing to make steps of faith that you put all you have on the line for God and watch what he does. He's not going to take away and make you destitute, but what he wants you to do is trust him. Such a good God. Switch over to uh, Psalm 84, just a little farther over about walking uprightly, how important that is. Psalm 84, uh, verses 11 and 12. It says, For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. God is wonderful. Okay, I want to Flip over here to 2 Corinthians real quickly again. Second Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians chapter 4, 17 and 18. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment. That's just life, by the way, folks. It's just for a moment. It seems long because we're measuring time. But it isn't very long at all. For this light, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Wow, God is, God is, God is, is so good. I mean, I, I, you know, when I was early in my ministry in El Paso, I, uh, uh, God wanted me to understand something about prayer. And um, over the years, uh, I would pray about things and, uh, and I would write about it in my prayer letter. And I'd, I, would have, I have had people come up to me and say, when I talked about, here was my prayer request, and, uh, and then I'd tell them what happened. I'd say, well, why didn't you come and ask me? I would have I I helped you. I said, well, I was asking God. Now, I wasn't trying to be self-righteous or anything, but, but God, uh, I, in fact, one time I, I mean, I was kind of, I've always been kind of a crazy character. But anyway, somebody was pressing me about this, you know. And so I said, okay, because I normally didn't, didn't put my struggles I was going through. So I made a list. I think I had seven things on that list. I have that, those prayer letters back somewhere. But I wrote down these seven things. This is what I'm, this is what I'm facing right now. And uh, like car and all this kind of stuff. And I said, on my next prayer letter, a month from now, I'm going to tell you how God answered those prayers. And... Uh, and then the following month came up, I relisted those things and I said, God did this, God did this, God did this. And one, uh, several of them were really miracle things and it was, and it was a blessing. And I, I didn't do that because I was trying to get somebody to think I'm some kind of a great guy. But when early in my ministry, uh, I, I was down in El Paso and, and some of you might remember this story, but I, uh, in fact, it was the first summer we went down there. And we, I, we had a two-week notice. I quit my job, and off we went. And I still had, and so we were praying about, you know, uh, I, I didn't know how much money I needed. And I kind of tried to figure out, because the church says, what we'll do is we'll support you 100% for three months. Just tell us how much money you need. So I was uh, very careful about that. I didn't want to take, you know, this is God's money. So I tried to figure down exactly what I needed, and off we went. And we had this wonderful summer, man. God did great things. And, oh, man, it was just spectacular. And, uh, and the church said, well, if you run into any problems, let me know. So I, uh, we got near the end of the summer. 
about 10 days before we're going to leave. And uh, I counted the money, and I realized that I was short. Now, we're in El Paso. We had to go back to Minnesota. I was short $500. I went, oh, man, where did I, five, short 500 You know, and I tried to figure it out. I tried to make sure that, you know, I had all the money, and I had enough money, and, but I, I didn't have enough. And I said, well, well, they said I should call them. So I called them, and I said, well, I, I, listen, I'm really sorry. I'm short some money for, for getting back. I said, how much you need? I said, well, about $500. And he said, okay. And they put $500 in the bank for me. They loved us, took care of us. We came back. Everything was fine. The second summer when I went there, the church paid half of my, and I raised half the money to go down. Now, I wanted to be really careful. I don't want to call the church and ask for any more money, because I remember the last year. I don't want them to think. So I tried to raise some extra money and so off we went. Had another summer, man. It was great. Everything was going wonderful. Man, I, it was just exciting. And we get to the end of the summer. I counted my money, and I was short about $500. Went, oh, man. Uh, God, I, I don't want to call him. Look at like, this guy. He just goes down there and keeps asking for money. And I thought, oh, terrible. And I thought, what happened to the money? And so then I was going back through things, and I saw there was a car problem here. And another somebody went to the doctor for something. And so I thought, Man, well, those things really weren't anything I had any control over. I didn't waste or throw money away. I said, so I am not going to call the church. I'm going to go in my prayer closet and give it to God. So I went in the prayer closet, and I said, Lord, I know you sent me down here, and I know you, I'm doing what you want me to do here, but, Lord, I can't handle the, the burden of this money. I don't know what to do. It was about 10 days before we were supposed to leave. And, and I said, so Lord, I'm giving it to you. And I remember this because that felt like, and I did, because it was like a big weight. It was off me. Oh, man, this is good. So I went in for the last mission trip, come back in seven days. And the uh, secretary said to me, uh, and we're, we have like three days and we're going to be leaving. She says, Brother Jarvis, this came in the mail for you. And it was a... Uh, a uh, card from Minnesota, and it was a, from a P.O. box. And I, I still don't know who sent this, but it was a check made out to me for $500. I went, glory to God. I was excited. Man. I know you go to God, man. You don't have to go to you know, the people. And I said, oh, man, this is just wonderful. And I, I went and I told my family. I said, this wonderful thing happened the next day. We still haven't left yet. This guy walks up to me and he says, God's led me to give, he's got this waving this check around. God's led me to give you this. And I said, wait, God did a miracle. He says, you don't need to do this. He says, hold it. God tells me to do something, I do it. He said, if I don't, I get in trouble with God. You want me to get in trouble with God? No. And he said, boom, shoves it to me. It's a check for another $500. I went, good night. God blesses abundantly. And so the last day before we could leave, another guy walked up to me with this envelope. He's waiting around. God's led me to give you this. I said, brother, I'm telling you, God has blessed me so much. I said, he says, hold it. When God tells me to do something, I do it. He hands me this. And in this envelope was $400 in cash. Now, as I would tell people, even a blockhead like me could figure out what's going on here. <laughs> the first summer, I needed $500, and I went to man. Man was able to meet that need. The second summer I needed $500, I went to God, and God met the need better than man ever could. And God said to me, buddy, when you got a need, you come to me. I'll take care of it. Don't be going around, because if you start going to people, you start going to them again, you know, rather than talking to me. I want you to do that. So God did that. God wants us to trust him like that, just like little children trust their parents. They don't worry about anything. Kids don't care who's president. You don't care about North Korea shooting rockets around. They don't care. Say, hey, Mom, I want some deed. Okay. I mean, he wants us to trust him like that, like little children. Our God is a good God. He does good things. What you see here is we have just this little time to honor God. That's the reason why this 70-year-old stepped through the door to go to Honduras, because I had the opportunity. Why not? <laughs> I said, do I, this is because I don't want to see my grandchildren in the States? Are you kidding? I love my grandchildren, but when I get to glory, I'm going to see them all the time. And I think that's wonderful. God wants us to honor him. He wants us to trust him. These times are going to get fearful. They're going to get worse. But 
don't be fearful because God doesn't want you to be fearful. Our God's a good God. He does good things. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we, we love you so much. We thank you for your goodness and mercy. And Lord, I, I just thank you for the, the goodness and the, the things that, Lord, that you've done for us. And I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen this church. You would strengthen the people here, strengthen their faith, to trust you, to see the victorious life, Lord, that you have right before them, that you want to give them. Lord, thank you for your goodness, your mercy, and your love. And Lord, as always, we thank you for what you are going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. With every head bowed and every eye closed, Nancy's going to begin playing. The question is, are we living for life? Or are we living for eternity? Let's all stand if you would. The altar's open. There's something the Lord's been working on your heart. That little red dot over there on the wall is pretty insignificant when it comes to the vastness of the rest of eternity.